Here's an announcement for teachers. The BBC is anxious to receive teachers' views on programmes in the series which follow this announcement. If you'd like to help, we'd be most grateful if you'd ring support services on 01992 or in Scotland 041332 or in Wales 0222 869-444 or write to support services P.O. Box 7 London W3 and now here's your programme That's the right decision now not to play next week you know, you're quite happy to practice I've on grass. So. For years. Yeah. So it's, it's, I've always felt more relaxed that way, right, just by practicing. What is it like to be a full time writer? During the summer, we saw two journalists at work a reporter who travels all over the world to cover sporting events, and a features editor who writes articles on subjects that will appeal to her teenage readers. How does the professional journalist write about sport? Let's hear from David Emery, reporter for the Daily Star. In the course of a year, I'd probably cover most kinds of sport, but I have um, responsibilities for three main areas. That's rugby, athletics, and tennis. When you're writing about sport, you don't simply give a blow-by-blow -blow description of what happens. There's much more to it than that. You've got to know about the personalities involved, because part of the fascination of sport is seeing how these people react in certain situations. Sue Barker is a perfect example of the way tensions and emotions can affect a person's form on a tennis court. About a year ago, she was ranked in the world's top five and was a very live possibility to win Wimbledon. And suddenly, she had a, a bad engagement, it went wrong. But now she's back again, single, and her tennis is improving all the time, and she's now a contender for a major title again. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, the extra help. <laughs> As a sports reporter on a popular paper, the actual events of the sport on court are only part of the job. You have to be a news reporter as well, always looking out for a hard news angle. And at the same time, you have to be a bit of a gossip columnist because you have to know exactly what's happening to all the leading players in your particular sport. For me, I suppose the after-match interview is just as important as the match itself because you glean so much information from the participants afterwards, telling you how they felt, how they think they're playing, their comments perhaps about the opposition. That can add tremendous colour and verve and life to a story. It doesn't just become a dead report about someone performing on court. It was centre court last year, wasn't it? You met her yeah. last time. Yes. And she had match points. Yeah, she had a set and five two match yes. points. There they go. So, the thing is that on these courts I'm starting really well and then getting worse as I go along. So hopefully I won't lose the first set. Yes. You when you're interviewing somebody like Sue Barker, of course you're always hoping they'll make some outrageous statement which will give you a tremendous story. But generally speaking, you can find your questions to the, the play that's happened, um, how she's feeling, the situation in general. And in this instance, of course, we're looking forward to Wimbledon. So the crucial question is, how does she feel her form is improving over the time? Well, I think uh, the reason is that you start so well as I warm up on the hard court out the back and you get a nice even bounce and you really get a rhythm going and you walk on the court and you feel like you're hitting the ball really well. Then uh, I got to fall love, I played one bad game and then let my service slip. And uh, you know, then you've just got to start battling because you're not going to get the bounces. I'm always looking for an angle to a story, a sort of peg to hang it on. Now Sue Barker's coach once compared her to an alley cat. He, he said if ever she got her back to the wall, she'd always manage to fight her way out. Now that's a sort of image which would immediately grab the reader's interest. And it's also a very accurate description of how she behaves under pressure. So I may well use that. And just get on there and, and battle it out. You know? How many semi-finals have we been in this, this year? I mean, quite a few, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Counting this one, I guess one, two, three, four, five, probably about six. Six. How many finals? Three. 
county wins. <laughs> One! <laughs> Sue Barker, Britain. Hello, sports desk, please. Please. If a story is wanted for tomorrow's newspaper, there's no time to sit down, head in hands, thinking up beautiful sentences. You've a limited time. It's the same for all journalists on daily papers. There's always a deadline to meet. And Barker said some good things about her form. You know, she's playing well now. Um, she had four brilliant games to start with today, and she's feeling confident. Um, so I thought copy about five o'clock-ish when Shriver's finished. What's, what's the space looking like? Time is the constant enemy. You're always looking for your deadlines. You can have the greatest story in the world, but if you're not on that phone at the right time, it's a dead story. It must appear in the newspaper. The newspaper has to be printed by a certain time to get on the planes and the trains for the distribution. There is a space in that newspaper, there's a hole in it, which is waiting for you to fill, and you have to provide them with words. The opening paragraph is the crux of the whole story. Everybody knows that you have to hook your reader in that opening paragraph. It has to be concise, colourful, informative, entertaining. When you're writing for a popular newspaper, the golden rule is to keep it simple. You never use a six-letter word if a four-letter word will do, provided it's a clean one. This story now is ready to go. I'm about to read it through to a copy taker. Hello, love. It's David Emery for Daily Star Sports Copy. Can you catch on it? Barker, please. B-A-R-K-E-R. -E OK, and it starts. All the alley cat instincts. Now, the copy taker sits at the other end of that telephone with headphones on and a typewriter. And you must assume, really, they know nothing. So you spell everything out to them, and they type it down exactly as you tell them. Were unsheathed again at Chichester yesterday, brackets Friday, point par. Point means full stop. It's just quicker than saying full stop. And par means paragraph. The 23-year-old Paynton, P-A-I-G-N-T-O-N, Paynton Blonde, who seemed to have forgotten how to fight, comma, scratched and clawed her way into the semi-finals of the Caps Crossley at C for Charlie. I don't see my report again now until it actually appears in the newspaper. The sub-editor will have chosen the headlines and he may well have decided to change part of what I've written. This time, only one word's been altered. I wrote, all the alley cat instincts that carried Sue Barker to the top of world tennis were unsheathed again at Chichester yesterday. The sub-editors changed unsheathed to on show. Well, I'm, I'm happy with the way it's been projected in the paper. It's on the back page. The headline is all important because it's all window dressing. You're trying to attract people. It's not a bad headline. Catwoman, exclamation mark. Barker claws her way through. Good, strong stuff. People would look at that. It would catch their eye. It should interest them, and then, of course, it ties in with my alley cat instincts in the opening paragraph, so it's a package deal. Now, you can contrast that, if you like, with, say, The Guardian, where their man is virtually guaranteed a certain amount of space. He's here to do a job on the tennis, to write about how the players are getting on. And because of that, he hasn't got to instantly attract people. His style of writing will be that much different. It's a more relaxed style, really. Um, He's got maybe 4, 8, 12, 16 inches of copy as compared to my 6. So, of course, he can go into much more detail. He can explain all the things he wants to say. Um, he's even got room here to give a virtual weather report on the way it's gone yesterday, which is nice. On an afternoon of wind, sun and rain, more suitable for sailing than tennis, few were prepared for Mrs King's 6-1, 6-2 victory over the top-seeded Martina Navratilova. Now, I'd love to write this sort of stuff in a, in a heavy newspaper, but in a popular paper, you just haven't got the room to indulge. Yeah? Jill Eckersley writes for the teenage magazine Look Now. It comes out once a month, so there isn't the same urgency as there is with a daily newspaper. Hello, Linda. How are you? Good. Jill is features editor, yeah. and every month she writes a special article, often based on an interview with someone from the world of entertainment from pop music, television, or films. Kurt Russell? Oh, yes. Well, who's he? Oh, the new Elvis film. Oh, yes, I've heard about that. Yes. But what else has he done? Are we like to have seen him on television or anything like that? 
Hawaii Five-O in the streets of San Francisco. Oh yes, okay. So this is his first big movie role, is it? Well, that, that sounds great. Um, 4.30, 22nd at the Dorchester, yeah. Yes, that's lovely. OK, that's fine, Linda. See you then. Bye. I have a fairly sizeable file of uh, biographical material in the office, which has been sent to me through the years by record companies and film companies. And when I hear that I'm going to do an interview with somebody, I go and look in the file to see if I have got anything on that particular artist. I wasn't, in fact, told very much about Kurt Russell as a person, so obviously the main thing I, I should be going on when I talk to him is uh, the extraordinary experience of portraying Elvis, who is the idol for so many people and has been for well, more than 20 years now. I think this is going to be an interesting point that we're going to have to bring out in the interview. I believe that Look Now is, is, has such a sort of relaxed style, so I don't prepare questions in advance because I know the kind of readers that we have and I know the kind of questions they'd like to ask. I just want a, a nice relaxed chat about himself as a person, about Kurt Russell the man and about Kurt Russell as Elvis. So how did you get involved with, with playing Elvis? Uh, the way I was uh, uh, chosen for the part was because of a uh, casting woman named Joyce Selznick. Mm -hmm. who had just cast the Buddy Holly story and they wanted her to do Elvis and she had me in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, they looked at a bunch of people, about mm -hmm. 1,500 I think, all together. But, but this, this uh, seems amazing to me because looking at you, I wouldn't look at you now and think, my God, that guy looks like Elvis Presley and yet in the, the f things I've got from the film, you look just like him. Well, uh, I think that's, thank you, I think that's uh, the job of a makeup man and a hairdresser and a wardrobe man and myself. Mm. I think that mm. when you put those elements together with somebody who's trying to create a character that's like mm -hmm. uh, Elvis Presley, uh, mm. you need those benefits. Mm. Yes, and the, the, the film was incredibly carefully researched. I, I, mm. It says in the, in the biographies and things which I've got, they, they, had, they talked to Elvis's father, I believe, and mm -hmm. to his secretary and two of the guys that work very closely with him. So it's, it's as authentic as you can possibly make it. Yeah, Priscilla Presley was involved with this in writing the scenes, especially between Elvis and Priscilla. Oh, really? And yeah. uh, uh, the guy who wrote the script was a guy who wrote three of Elvis's scripts mm -hmm. that he did, and he was pretty close to Elvis. Mm -hmm. uh, we had Charlie Hodge as a technical advisor who uh, was, uh, lived with Elvis for 20 years and was very close to him. So we had a lot of people around us. Mm. who were very close to Elvis and mm. <clears throat> I think knew a lot about him and, and wanted to do something that uh, they felt uh, would be a positive look at a legend. Mm. I'm sure. As far as I'm concerned, an interview is a two-way process and it would be very stiff and formal if whatever the, the interviewee said to me, I was to go on with a completely different question. I find that the conversation flows from what he says. Sometimes he says something that I want to pick up on or I find interesting or I want to argue with or agree with and the conversation flows from there. It's a conversation, it's not just me sort of reeling out a lot of questions and him reeling back a lot of answers. Very, uh, I, f I find a tape recorder is, uh, is a nice way of doing an interview because it helps both you and the person you're interviewing to relax much more easily than you would be able to if I was sitting there making notes all the time. I, f I find and, uh, that makes me lose the thread of what I'm saying and it holds up the sort of flow of conversation, the sort of natural flow of two father. people talking to each other is not broken up at all. If you just switch the tape recorder on, you can forget it. Everyone believes that writing for a magazine is a glamorous job, and of course it can be when you're in an expensive hotel talking to a film star. And when I come to transcribe the tape, it's uh, a pretty boring job, really. Quite often I listen to the, the interview at home because it's quiet there, there's no distractions and I've got space and time and can please myself and also it means I don't disturb anybody else because the, the people I share my office with have got their own work to do and I can't, they can't always get out of the room and give me an empty room. So, uh, the chosen for the part was because of a uh, casting. When I write up the article from an interview, I try and use as many as possible of the actual words which the artist used and these are called quotes. I li obviously link it together with a few um, observations of my own or bits about his past history and the things he's done before, but I think it's much more interesting for the readers if they 
can hear what he has to say, because after all, that's what an interview is all about. I try and get the spirit of what the artist was talking about across to the readers of the magazine. Starting an article is much the most difficult part of writing one, I think, because in the first sentence or so, you've got to try and capture the reader's interest and make them want to find out more. If they see something at the beginning of an article that catches their attention and makes them think, ooh, you know, that, that looks as if it's going to say something interesting, then they're going to buy the magazine, which is uh, what we all want. When I first met Kurt Russell, the thing that surprised me was that he didn't look at all like Elvis Presley. So I decided to use that idea for the beginning of the article. When I was introduced to Kurt Russell, my first thought was that he didn't look a bit like Elvis. In the film Elvis the Movie, he plays the part of the king of rock and roll. It must be a daunting prospect for any actor to play someone like Elvis. In the when you're writing up an interview or any other kind of article, you always have to bear in mind that you've only got so many columns or so many words to work in, and then if you write more than is needed to fill the page, then it'll just be cut. The sub-editors have to calculate exactly how many lines of copy can be kept in the article and how many lines have to be sacrificed. Again, to get the balance between a page that looks good and looks attractive and doesn't just look like a whole sort of wadge of boring words and a page where there's so few words you don't learn anything about Kurt Russell at all. Each page of the magazine is designed by the art department and when they know that I'm going to do an interview with Kurt Russell, what they'll do is send to the publicity company for some pictures of him and then they'll have a look at the, a selection of pictures and they'll choose one that they think will make a, an attractive page. The page is then designed to get the balance, really, between the way it looks and the number of words we've got fitted in. It's always nice to see the finished copy of Look Now and to see the articles because you remember all the, the problems that went into putting it together. There's a certain amount of, of skill involved in making the actual interview you do with somebody interesting to readers. You have to slightly alter what people have said, not by misquoting them, but by saying what they say in a, a more concise and more, a, more, a shorter way, because the way people talk isn't quite the way people write or the way people want to read. For example, uh, when I spoke to Kurt Russell, one of the things I was interested in was the amount of help he'd had from Elvis Presley's family in creating the role of Elvis in the film. And he said that uh, Priscilla Presley had, had been involved in writing the scenes between Elvis and his wife. Well, when I actually put that in the magazine, the actual words I used were, in quotation marks, Priscilla Presley, Elvis's ex-wife, was involved in writing the scenes between Elvis and his wife. I had to put in Elvis's ex-wife, just in case readers didn't know that Priscilla Presley was Elvis's ex-wife. They might not have known that. Um, Kurt Russell obviously knew, he knew I knew, but he didn't say Elvis's ex-wife because he, we both knew who she was, but I had to add it, just in case the readers didn't understand. I think the main difference between writing for a daily paper and for a monthly magazine like Look Now is simply the matter of time scale. A daily journalist has to file his story by the end of the day if it wants to appear in the next day's uh, newspaper. We have more time to think about it and more factors to take into account. I think there are a lot of similarities too between um, newspaper and magazine journalism in that the basic thing a journalist is trying to do is to make his story as interesting as possible to the kind of readers who read his newspaper or magazine. Uh, in, in that respect, it's, it doesn't matter whether you're interviewing a tennis star or a film star or anyone, you, you want to make the person sound as interesting as possible to your readers.